So, today we're going to start off, uh, finish our discussion about exceptions. Bye bye, Jeff. Um, we're going to finish talking about exceptions. Jeff Tweedy performed last night. Did anyone go to that show? Jeff Tweedy at the Virginia? I guess I didn't go either. I was hoping somebody would. They would tell me about it. Um, all right, so I think he's from around here, actually. Um, you guys have no idea what I'm talking about, do you? Anyway, we can talk about it on the forum. Um, so today we're going to finish talking about exceptions, and then we're going to start talking about maps. So maps in, are the other data structure you meet in heaven. We've met one of them so far this semester, which is lists. Maps are the second. Um, but before we get there, we're going to talk about this mysterious um, type of class of functions called hash functions that we're going to use as we create um, a simple map implementation together on Monday. All right, so let's get through talking about exceptions to start. So review from last time. So in Java, we break exceptions into three broad categories. Um, we have checked exceptions. So these are exceptions that your code is going to generate by using this throw keyword, which we're going to talk about in a minute. These are thrown explicitly by your code. They're not generated by accident. They're generated on purpose. And they're designed to signal to someone who's using your code that something went wrong and a little bit about what happened so something can handle this particular type of error. This is called, these exceptions are called checked exceptions because they're actually checked by the compiler. So the compiler can determine what function throws an exception because the function has to declare that it throws an exception. And then the compiler will help you by checking your code to make sure that somewhere that exception is caught. We talked a little bit about exceptional code flow last time, so it's possible that that uh, exception is caught by the caller of the function, but that exception can also be thrown all the way up the stack from the caller to the caller of the caller to the caller of the caller. Somewhere, someone has to catch that exception. So these checked exceptions, are thrown explicitly, and they need to be caught somewhere in the program. And again, they're designed to indicate that in certain circumstances, something can go wrong in the surrounding environment that can make your code behave um, in an unexpected way. So again, if you're trying to make some sort of network API request and the network goes down, uh, that can generate a checked exception that some part of your program then has to handle. A lot of times, you know, you had handled these by producing some sort of failure message or maybe retrying that same operation later or something like that. Okay, so unchecked exceptions, also known as runtime errors, um, these are unchecked because they're accidental. They're caused by programmer error. You messed up. You didn't realize that a reference was null and you tried to dereference it. You didn't realize that an array only had n elements and you tried to access the n plus one, the n plus one element. I'm gonna give up on that. Um, so these are caused by you. They're not checked by the compiler because you don't declare them because you didn't know that you were about to make that mistake because if you did, you would have fixed it. Okay, so this is the second category of exceptions. These are the most, two most important ones to understand how to use as a Java program. And the last one was this category of errors. Um, you guys have seen Stack Overflow errors when you've been writing your recursive functions to explore trees and other things. Um, these are also typically caused by programmer error, uh, but they're more difficult to recover from than these unchecked exceptions are. Uh, they indicate usually that the interpreter has encountered some sort of problem. So a stack overflow error will cause the interpreter to run out of memory. Uh, you might have allocated too many objects, um, so that might cause something to run out of memory. Um, these are usually not recoverable. Sometimes they are, uh, but in most cases they're not. All right, so our, our three categories. All right? And we also talked about strategies for handling each type of exception. So checked exceptions, so errors, there's not, much, not really much you can do about, right? These are usually going to cause uh, your program to crash. Um, you know, unchecked exceptions, these you want to identify. This is, you know, you guys might be right wondering, well, you know, you're, you're gonna go on, you're gonna take courses, and at some point in your life as a programmer, you're gonna start to do this thing called writing tests. We've done that for you this semester, um, but in the future, you're gonna write the kind of tests that we've been providing for your MPs um, and for the homework problems in order to test your own code. Why? Because the compiler can't determine everything for you when you actually compile your code. There's still mistakes that you might make that could happen when the code is run. This is one of the reasons why we write and run test cases and why testing is such an important part of uh, modern software development, particularly at large companies, but pretty much everywhere. Everyone who writes serious software that gets used by large numbers of people writes tests. Um, and this is why, because tests will frequently 
um, expose these type of unchecked exceptions, mistakes that you made in your code that were based on some sort of assumption uh, that turned out to be incorrect, right? If you can identify those during testing, you can fix them and make sure they don't happen uh, when someone is actually trying to use your program. So checked exceptions, now again, it really depends on, this, this case ends up being very context specific. So it depends on what the exception is and what your options are at that point. Like I said before, sometimes a checked exception will generate some type of error message, right? So, you know, you might have, you know, I was, so just this morning, so example, just this morning as I was driving away from my house, I remembered, you know, we have some people coming over tonight, so I wanna start our, our Roomba. I wanna start our robotic vacuum, get it going so it can clean up the house a little bit while we're away. So I stopped the car, of course, because I would never use my phone while driving. Um, so I pulled over and I, and I got out the, my phone and I was like trying to start the, you know, our Roomba using this app that you get, right? Well, at that point, my phone was like still connected to my home Wi-Fi because I was only like 50 feet down the street, um, but the signal wasn't very good. And so essentially I was, and the phone was in the process, you guys have seen it do this, right? It's in the process of transitioning from the Wi-Fi network um, that you might be using inside the building or wherever you live to the LTE network that I use, you know, when I'm out and about. And right at that moment, there was no network connection. So the app is sort of sitting there thinking, 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 and finally it threw up an error message and said, you know, could not contact whatever, right? That was probably generated by some type of checked exception thrown by some piece of software that this particular uh, iRobot app used. And the way it decided to uh, respond to that was by producing an error message. Now, again, what happened? Well, you know, 30 seconds later, I was reconnected to the network and I, you know, hit the button again to start up the robot and off it went, right? So sometimes a transient failure like this is something that you can just wait for a few minutes and retry the same operation, right? But it really depends on, on what's gonna happen. As you guys are working on your final project, I suspect you're gonna have this happen. You're gonna try to use some library, you're gonna try to call some routine, and you're gonna get this um, error when you try to compile from the compiler saying that you haven't caught the exception. And then you have to think about, what should I do here, right? Is there something I can do gracefully to handle this if it fails? Should I just give up? Should I not do that thing? Um, should I inform the user? Should I retry? How do I handle this particular error? But it depends very much on what the error is and what you were trying to do and what your options are at that particular point. Um, but, you know, don't try to make forward progress unless it's possible, right? So that's one, you know, important thing to keep in mind. You know, don't continue on in your code when you really shouldn't, right? Um, you know, like, so, so let's say the user was trying to do something like they were trying to, like I said, like I was trying to start up my robotic vacuum, right? Well, it's better to tell me that something went wrong than to be like, oh, we're all good, right? And then I get home later and the thing's been sitting there in the corner all day not doing anything and my house is full of dog food. I would much, much rather know that it failed because then I as a human can take some action about, about how to handle that problem. All right. So you guys sort of discovered this. Yesterday was one of my favorite homework problems of the entire semester. I don't feel like very many of you agreed with me about that. Um, but there were aspects of this that were really designed to get you thinking about this because in Java, thrown exceptions are just another type of object. There's nothing special about that. It's just another type of object. Um, there's this special control construct that we talked about last time that allows you to catch them when they're thrown, but I can return them from a function, like we asked you to do yesterday. I can also throw them, right? Um, they also contain information about what happened and what went wrong that is frequently useful to you when you're, uh, when you're working with them. So for example, Java exceptions, like every other Java object, remember, have a two-string method. They can be printed. We saw that last time. We were passing exceptions to system.out.println. Usually what it prints is some string that indicates what, except what the exception type was. It really depends on what type of exception it is. When you print a null pointer exception, you just get null pointer exception. When you print an array out of bounds index exception, you actually might get some information about what index caused the problem, right? Um, so again, there's a two string method, just like every other object. There's a get message method. Sometimes that returns a little bit more information about the exception. Um, and then there's also this print stack trace um, method. So when you guys have been working with errors um, and exceptions on the homework problems and in IntelliJ, usually what you see shown to you, you guys have had a lot of practice about interpreting this, which is really good because it's not the last time you're gonna have to work 
with problems, and certainly not the last time you're gonna make a mistake when you try to solve a problem, um, the information you get is usually something called a stack trace. It shows you the series of function calls that led to the point where your code had a problem. So it identifies not only the line of your code that caused the problem, or whatever line of code caused the problem, but it identifies how we got there. What function called your function, what function called that function, et cetera. All exceptions to Java inherit from this class. Um, so this is something in Java that's called throwable. We're gonna see why it's called throwable in a minute, because I can use it as part of this throw statement in Java. So anything I can throw in Java is part of this class called throwable. Throwable inherits directly from object, and it has two subclasses, errors and exceptions. And then the exception subclass is further broken down along the lines that we talked about before. So everything in Java that I can throw has, um, inherits from throwable, and throwable has, you know, these messages. Uh, these, um, these different, so I've got this print stack trace method I just told you about. I've got a get message method. It says return the detail message string of this throwable. Usually that gives me a little bit more information about the error, not just the name, but something more about what went wrong. All right, so, so again, you know, let, we, let's, let's, you know, get some practice working with these. So I've got a, a function called foo1 that's going to generate an exception. Right, and I've got a call stack, so I've called foo3, which is called foo2, which is called foo1, um, and so the, the catch statement is actually all the way up in foo4. And so I'm gonna be able to catch an exception here. I can print that exception out, right? Nope, if it's gonna, right, so I can see that it prints a null pointer exception. I can also call to string directly. I don't need to do this, but if I do, I'm gonna get the same thing. Um, I can call uh, get, is it get message? Try that. Um, in this case, it returns null, right? So there's no extra information about this. If I instead, let's try this. Let's say int array, let's create an empty array and create an array index out of bounds exception. So I say, I'm gonna create an empty array and then I'm gonna try to access the fourth element of it. Um, now my get message returns uh, four, right? Um, why is that? see here. Now it returns two, right? So in this case, there's more, the, the detail string tells me the index that caused the problem, right? So if I just print the um, exception itself, it's just gonna say Java, oop, it's gonna say Java to lang dot array index out of bounds exception, and then it gives me more information, right? The array index that caused the problem, which is frequently very useful in solving, solving the problem. But I still don't know exactly where this happened. And so now let's try this print stack trace method that we looked at. So if I call e.print stack trace. So now this is going to, um, and if you, if you use this in IntelliJ or on the homework problems, you're gonna see more useful information here. Um, this is a function of how uh, this, this online compiler that we use uh, for these examples in class. But you can still see the stack trace. So I see that um, I'm executing foo1, right? and foo1 was called by foo2, which was called by foo3, which was called by foo4. So I can see exactly how I got to this point in my code. And again, if you, if you look at this type of message on our homework problems or in, an, or in an Android Studio, what you're gonna see is you're gonna see line numbers uh, and source files here, which allow you to trace from you know, point to point exactly how you got to this particular stuff. You guys have been looking at these all semester, right? And I think at this point you've gotten fairly good at interpreting this information. And that's actually really important, right? You know, I've told you some of you this in person when you've come to office hours, been frustrated about a homework problem or how you did on the quiz, but you will never stop making mistakes as a program, ever. Um, you know, you'll go on, you'll learn other languages, you'll get better at certain things, uh, you'll develop some confidence, hopefully you're, you've, you've developed a little bit of that along the way in this class, but you will never stop making mistakes. I make hundreds of mistakes every day right, when I'm writing code and working with the tools, and most of these things are things that I've built. Um, that never stops. What you get better at is fixing them really quickly, right? Seeing the error output, figuring out, okay, right, okay, I did this dumb thing, going back and, and correcting it, right? So, you know, you're never gonna get to the point where you don't make mistakes as you're trying to build things, right? Logical errors, syntax errors, I mean, they're all still out there, right? And you'll keep hitting them, um, but 
you just get really, really good at taking the information that the program is telling you about what happened and pull, pulling that back, going back to your source code and being able to fix the problem, right? That some, becomes something that's really second nature, right? So, you know, again, don't try to become a perfect programmer that doesn't make any mistakes. That's impossible, right? I suspect if you talk to master hackers, right, that have been doing this for decades, um, you know, you will find out that they still make mistakes all the time. In fact, there's a, there's a famous, there was a, there's a piece about them, maybe I'll po post it on the forum. So there's a famous um, team of programmers at Google. Uh, so Google has levels for their technical employees. Uh, the lowest level is level one. Um, and then you, as you uh, work at the company and they see that you're technically capable, you graduate to these higher and higher levels, right? So I think like once you get to level eight, you're typically kind of like nationally famous uh, for a particular mastery of a particular piece of technology. There's only like maybe a dozen people that have got to level nine. There's a handful of people at level 10, right? Uh, these are people that like built Google's entire search feature or something like that, right? There are two people at level 11. They're the only people in the company at this. And what's interesting about them is that, and this also relates to what we're doing in lab this week, they spend a lot of their time together pair programming. So they have spent hours and hours, they're, they're like really good friends, they're almost like two brains that have been joined together, right? They spend a lot of time working together where one of them is typing and the other one is watching. Why? Because they still make mistakes. And it's helpful to have another set of eyes and another brain to think about the problem as you're going along, right? I'll post that article, it's a really, really interesting story. It's a really neat friendship as well between these two people. Okay, so. So one thing you can do with exceptions, because they're just objects, right, um, is you can, um, you know, if, if, you, if you don't want to handle the exception, you can also just re-throw it out of a catch block. So here's an example of doing that. That also introduces us to this new exception throwing mechanism. So we've ta we talked about try and catch, which is how we run code that might generate an exception and then catch it if it does happen. But here's an example, and this is sort of something that you might use as part of your Android code, where I had an error that happened, and here I want to do two things. I want to record what happened. So I have a, a, some logging code that logs that an error occurred, and then I just, down here, I just throw the exception again. So I caught the exception briefly, I did some stuff, recorded what happened, and now I'm just throwing it again out of the catch block. Um, and so what will happen is this, this code will now throw that exception. And again, the, um, the declaration of this function is incorrect. It needs to declare that it throws a URI syntax exception because I'm throwing it out of catch block. So this is another pattern that you can use when all I want to do is record a little bit about what happened. I actually don't want, I don't, can't handle the exception. I don't know what to do, but I want to note that it took place. All right, so throw. Let's talk about generating your own exception. So we've talked a little bit about how to work with exceptions up until this point, how to catch them, you know, how to wrap code into try catch block so that you can handle when things go wrong, but what about using them in your own code? So we got here because we started talking about what do you do if somebody makes an incorrect call to a function that you wrote? So, you know, you created the string storage class. We started with this um, on, on Wednesday. This is sort of how we launched this discussion. And they're creating, so this is the constructor. Remember, the constructor can't fail. It can't return null. But it can throw exceptions, right? And so in this case, if you've tried to create a string storage which with a zero or a negative size, that makes no sense, right? You can't store a negative number of strings. Um, so in that case, I actually want to signal to the caller that they've made a mistake. How do I do this? I do this by throwing an exception. So this is one of the last Java, bits of Java syntax we're gonna talk about. You just saw it on the slide, but now let's use it. So I can throw exceptions. I can throw my own exception. I've gotta create the exception object, and then I pass it to this built-in um, Java keyword called throw. So let's, so let's say, um, you know, if storage size is less than zero, I'm gonna throw some type of exception, right? So let's say, throw new exception invalid size, right? Okay, so, so now when I try to compile this, I'm getting this error, and the error is because I haven't declared, remember, if I'm gonna throw a checked exception, 
I haven't declared that uh, string storage throws this type of exception. However, am I, what am I dealing with here? Should I be throwing a checked exception or an unchecked exception? Is this error, like, due to some feature of the universe that's outside of my control, or is this error due to programmer error? Okay, I've got documentation. Documentation says that storage size must be positive. All right, I wrote my Java doc, published it online, I'm all good. What am I dealing with here? Should I treat this as programmer error or as some, you know, uh, external error, error that's caused by something that happened external to my program? How, how, how do I handle this? What do you guys think? Yeah. You think it's a checked error, okay? Anyone wanna, anyone wanna argue otherwise? Again, unchecked errors are because of your mistakes, yeah. Yeah, so whose fault is this? If storage size is less than or equal to zero, whose fault is it? Is it like something that happened that's unavoidable? Like again, the network went down for a minute, is that what happened? Or is it because someone didn't read my beautiful documentation? Yeah, so this is an example of programmer error. And because of that, Java provides a built-in exception that I can use in this case. Um, and that's called an illegal argument, argument exception. Okay, so now you'll see that the code compiled and ran, and when I tried to create a string storage object with size negative one, an exception occurred, okay? So what I did is rather than throwing a checked exception, I was like, wait, hold on, this isn't my fault. This isn't something I should have to deal with. I wrote documentation, I told you what to do. If you didn't read it, it's on you. And so now what I'm doing is I'm throwing an unchecked exception. And the reason for this is that whoever wrote this needs to go back and fix their code so they don't pass a negative parameter into my function. And this is a very helpful exception to use whenever you're writing and, and part of the reason for this is that um, there are other languages like, um, you know, C-like languages that provide, for example, an unsigned integer, so I can, I can make sure that the integer is, um, is positive. Java doesn't do that. Java, I just have an int. So anytime I pass it into a function, it can be negative. There's a lot of cases where negative numbers don't make sense for particular things, and this case is one of them. Zero doesn't make sense here either, right? And so to defend against this, I can do some parameter checking at the top, and throw this type of exception to indicate that somebody called my function incorrect. Questions about this? David, did you have a? Yeah. Mm. Okay, how can we tell? So is legal, if, if I just showed you this code, it's a great quiz question for next week, maybe. If I just showed you this code, how would you know whether or not it's a checked exception or an unchecked exception? You could look it up, but how would you know? Just from, just from reading this code. How could I tell? We also have to know what the compiler would say. So this code compiles, and therefore, legal argument is a checked exception or an unchecked exception. Somebody make the argument either way. What would I need if it was a checked exception? Well, I mean, let's try it, right? So let's, like, so, so the exception class itself is checked, okay? So if I change that to exception, I get a compiler error. But the code didn't even run. So the, and what is the compiler telling me? It says, you're throwing a checked exception, you have to declare that you're gonna throw it. So the code won't compile until I change this method signature and say throws exception. Now, now it'll, it'll compile, but now it's telling me I've got to catch it down here, right? So remember, when I throw a checked exception, the compiler is going to do a, uh, it's going to help me. It's going to help me uh, make sure that that exception is handled, right? So now down here, I have to wrap this in a try-catch block and stuff like that. Um, normally when you're dealing with parameter errors, like someone didn't read the documentation, this is one of the reasons that we don't want to do this, because it forces us put a lot more machinery around, um, around the function, right? 
So this is an unchecked exception. It's unchecked because I don't need to declare that the function throws it, and it's unchecked because the code that calls it doesn't have to be wrapped in a try catch block. Again, the idea here is that, um, you know, this indicates that a, the programmer made a mistake, right? And, and if the programmer made a mistake, the right thing to do here is to not figure out what to do if I messed up, it's to not mess up in the first place. And don't call, don't try to create a string storage class with a zero or negative size, right? Doesn't make any sense. Even string storage of size one is kind of dumb, right? Why would I want to store one string? I can already do that, right? So I could change this to, 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 to take a, you know, a, a larger, uh, to defend against even a smaller print. Questions about this? Or go on. Again, this, this pattern of how, we, how you work with exceptions is something that's very popular, right? You see it in Python, you see it in JavaScript, you see it now in new versions of Go. Um, this is a very, you see it in C++, right? This is a very, very common pattern. So again, just to, just to wrap up, this is like literally the last Java keyword that we're gonna see this semester. Um, to throw an exception, I use this throw keyword. And because it's, it, throw is a little strange in the sense that I can, um, you'll see right here, I'm not, I don't have to put parentheses after it, I can. So if you want to use, check style probably has an opinion about this, I actually don't know what it is. Um, you know, but, but both of these will work. Throw is not a function, it's a keyword in the language, right? You can kind of treat it like a function and pass it um, an exception as an argument, um, or you can not, that's up to you, right? So I create an exception, I throw it, right? And what I, what I need to provide to throw is an exception. It's an, anything of type throwable. We saw that exceptions inherit from throwable, so exceptions are throwable. Errors are also throwable. Um, so I can throw an error in certain cases. Sometimes that's what I going to do. Okay. Now, now again, when you're writing code, there are going to be places where, you know, so th th there's this interesting question of when do we use this mechanism? How do I know when it's time to, to generate an error? Okay. One way that you know is when you don't know what to do past that point. So, again, if I go back and look at my, uh, my string storage class, like the next thing I'm gonna do in my constructor is probably like set up an array of strings with the, with the right size or something like that, or an array list or whatever. But if the, if the size is negative, I can't even do any of this stuff. I can't create an array with a negative size. So if you're really struggling to figure out like how to go on in any useful way in a piece of code, that may be a good place to throw an error, right? Um, that could be a time to you know, throw an error that indicates, you know, if, if the error is caused by a bad input, throw an error to the user saying, I don't know what to do now. You know, you gave me bad, you gave me a bad parameter, uh, please read the documentation, right? Um, now the question is, which type of exception should you actually throw? So Java has many, many, many existing exceptions out there. We just use one of them, the illegal argument exception. You can also create your own exceptions. So when you guys are, you know, years from now when you guys are writing and maintaining Java libraries, you may want to create your own exceptions to indicate different types of failures that are specific to the code that you're writing, right? So I was working on, I started working on a library that we're gonna to use to improve how we test homework problems, make it easier to write them next semester, and one of the things I was thinking about early on was, you know, should, should we have a couple of custom exception types as part of this library that, are, that indicate errors that are specific to what we're trying to do? Right? Exception is just another class that you can extend like any other. So I can create, um, you know, a class called my exception that extends exception, and then I can throw that. Right? And this now has a type. It's throwable because it descends from exception, but it has a type. I can provide uh, more information about it. I can add fields. Right? So these are just Java objects. Just a special type of Java object that happens to be something that you can pass to the throwable. All right, we are almost done. So this is like a great place to stop with exceptions. Uh, finally, finally about exceptions. So I just want you to see this because this is actually kind of a neat, um, a neat uh, primitive. So not only do I have a try catch block in Java, but I also have this last clause I can add. It's optional. The catch clause is not optional. If you open up a try block, you have to have a catch, at least one, potentially multiple. Finally is optional. 
What's cool about finally is that the code in the finally block is always executed. It gets executed if I get all the way through the try statement without generating an exception, and it gets executed even if I generate an exception and I exit the catch block. So finally is always the last thing that happens. Always. Okay? And this can be useful in certain cases if you want to do some cleanup or whatever. So again, here's what's going to happen. Um, I have a piece of code that about half the time is going to generate an exception. So this time, it did. I called could error, and I got a null pointer exception. I jumped into the catch clause, I print catch, and then I jump into the finally clause and print final. Okay? Here's a case where it didn't generate an exception. So I started here, I ran my line that print start, I ran the piece of code that could generate an error. In this case, it didn't, it just returned. Um, I printed done, and then I print final. So it doesn't matter um, what I put, what happens in the try and catch. The finally block is always executed, always, after either the try catch block uh, is finished. So here's, here's the last thing I want to show you. And again, this is one of these things that's going to annoy you. Maybe some of the CAs already helped you discover this when you were working on MP3. So one of the things you can do with try is you can use it to avoid this like really repetitive, very verbose uh, checking for things. So here's an example that might look familiar to you from MP3. So I've got some a piece of JSON, and I'm trying to parse it. And I'm trying to parse it by essentially, the first thing I'm gonna do is see if it has a metadata key. If it doesn't, I can't go on. Oh, so now I get the metadata stuff, right? If the metadata doesn't have a width key, I can't go on. And now I get all the way to the bottom, and now I, I finally get the width field from this particular um, uh, piece of JSON. But if the JSON is malformatted, it might not have a metadata key, it might not have a width key, so I might not get all the way to the bottom, but I've got all this really, really repetitive code. And the point is that if the JSON is now formatted, I'm always gonna do the same thing. In this case, the function is returning zero if it finds invalid JSON. So instead of this, I can rewrite this as this, okay? So I'm using try to help me out. I put all the things I want to do inside this try block, and I can also chain them together. So I can essentially say, parse the JSON, get the top level as an object, get the metadata key as an object, get the width as a field, and then get it as an int. I'll just chain those all together. That looks really nice, right? It's a lot more readable than this. It gives me a, a sense of exactly what the code is trying to do. Now, if anything goes wrong, if it doesn't have a metadata field, then this is gonna return null, and then I'm gonna try to access null, and so I'm gonna get a null pointer exception. If the, if the metadata object doesn't have a width field, then this is gonna return null, and I'm gonna get a null pointer exception. If the width isn't an int, then width is gonna return like a string, and I'm not gonna be able to parse it as an int, so the last call is gonna return an error. So I've got a bunch of places here where, where something can fail. But I don't care. Just try everything. And wherever it fails, if the JSON is malformatted, I don't care, because I always do the same thing. So down here in my catch block, I'm just returning zero. That's the same thing I was doing here anytime I encountered an error. But now I've taken all the error handling logic and I put it in one place. Because again, I don't care what's wrong with the JSON. I don't care about whether or not it's missing this field or that field, right? I told you the structure that I wanted or I was expecting, and you know, if it doesn't match that schema, you know, who knows, right? Something could be wrong, you know, maybe I was using the wrong API or something like that, maybe the API returned me some bogus data this one time, um, but all I need to do down here is catch all the errors in one place. So again, you know, this, very repetitive. It's also very hard to figure out what the code is trying to do, right? Whereas here, it's very obvious to me that you're essentially trying to extract, you know, object.metadata.width as an int, right? I can, I can read all of your code that's actually doing anything together. Okay, a little trick using try catch. All right, questions about this stuff before we go on? David, yeah. No, 
oh, sure, sure I can. I wrote documentation, right, that I provided with the class, right? And the documentation for that function says, pass me a positive integer. Yeah. So the question is, isn't it out of my control what people pass to my constructor? Yeah, it is. But it's not an error in the environment. Again, the, the, question, the, the question to determine whether or not something's a checked exception or unchecked exception, I think the best way to think about that is, is it due to programmer error, right? In this case, I told you how to use this function and you didn't listen. It's on you, right? At some level, that's really the equivalent of a null pointer exception, right? Or an array index out of bounds exception, you messed up. Some of you have probably, how many people have generated an illegal argument exception this semester at some point? Yeah, like for, like we had some, uh, uh, a copy of array, right? That was one place where you might have got that, right? Because you passed a, a, an integer that was too big, right? Some of you might have saw that and wondered what was going on. Well, copy of array, if you read the documentation, it's got rules, right? About, you know, you can't pass it like a negative start, right? The, the, the two bounds have to be within the, the size of the array, right? So that's an example. You didn't have to use the try catch block there because it's in the document. Right, so it's really on you to make sure that the parameters you pass to copy of array are, are same. Good question. Yeah. You can. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, you could, you can throw out of, so you can throw inside a try, right? It'll just be caught right here. Yeah. So the question was, if I have throws, can I have also have a try catch block in the same function? Yeah, yeah. You can have a throw inside your try block. Sometimes that's also, sometimes that's the right thing to do, right? I won't show you some examples of that, but there are cases where um, that actually can make your code a lot clean. If you throw immediately out of a, of a try. Good question, other questions? Before we change gears again. Okay, so, before we, we meet again on Monday, and so on, again, on Monday we're going to talk about this, you know, the, the, the second data structure you meet in heaven. This other really magical data structure that you can use to solve a huge, wide variety of problems, right? And I apologize that we're getting to this so late in the semester. I would love to figure out a way to teach this stuff a little bit earlier, but in Java it requires some machinery um, that we, we're not completely comfortable with. So that's why it ends up here, okay? But let me set the stage over the last 10 minutes, okay? Because the, uh, this magical uh, data structure called a map uh, or a hash table or an anonymous object in JavaScript or a dictionary in Python, many languages have this, right? This, this, this fantastic data structure depends on us having a function with the following properties. So we are not, I'm not gonna prove that these functions exist. I'm not gonna show you examples of them. Well, I'll show you some examples. I'm not gonna show you the implementation, right? But here is, a function that we, here are some properties of a function that we want, okay? So, first property, it's deterministic. If I run it on the same input, and essentially I wanna be able to run this on any Java object, I always get the same result, okay? So that's really important. Um, and it's gonna take an arbitrary size uh, object and convert it into a fixed size unit of information. If I repeat that calculation, I get the same result. Okay. Second property I want. If I give this function lots of different inputs of different types, lots of different objects, over time, I want it to have an equally likely probability of generating every different output. So let's say the output is an integer between zero and 15. Over time, I want the probability that I get four to be the same as the probability that I get eight to be the same as the probability I got three or the probability that I end up with 11. Okay, so this is called uniformity. Over many inputs, each output value is equally likely. Again, the output's deterministic, but if I give it lots and lots of different inputs, eventually every output is selected about the same number of times. And finally, at least for now, we'll talk about how to relax this requirement on Monday. This is efficient to compute. It's fast, it doesn't take very long to produce this result. All right? So, now it, it, it turns out, this is one of the fun things about Java. So remember, there were a couple, Java objects had a couple, we talked about three useful built-in functions, right? One of them was equals, right? Another one is 
to a string, what was the third? Hash code, right? So hash code is now uh, going to going to come into play. Let's let's see how we do this, right? So I'm going to uh, we're going to work on this just for a minute together, right? So I've got this function called hash. Let me feed it in an array of ints. Let's give it one, two, five. Okay, and we'll print the result. Right. So right now it's zero. What's one way that we could so, so what's one possible way to implement this function, given an array of inputs? Remember, I need to return it along. Um, what's one way to do this? Yeah. Why don't we, why don't we just sum everything together, right? So imagine I just take all the values out of my input array, and, and now I return the sum. Right, so is this deterministic? It is. Um, is it gonna give me, um, what, what's the range of this, of this function? So now it's long, right? But let's make this a little bit more interesting. Let's, let's imagine that I limit the range of the function to only values between zero and 16 by just doing the modulus at the end, or the remainder operator in Java, right? Okay, so now I've got a function that, that is kind of doing the right thing. If I pass it to, um, you'll notice that no matter how large the array is, how many elements I put in here, I'm always going to get a value between zero and 15. You'll also notice that it's relatively fast to compute. This is like O-N, I just have to do one pass to the array. Um, if I give it the same array twice, I'm gonna get the same value. And if you imagine that I pass it lots and lots and lots of arrays over time, eventually the probability that I get zero is gonna be about the same as the probability that I get 15, right? So here's one potential way to implement a hash function. Happily though, I can also just do this. So this is Java, and so there you go. A built-in function in Java called hash code that every single object has. Arrays in Java are objects, okay? Wanna show you something. Let's see, let's see if this is actually deterministic. Yeah, so, so hash code in Java, um, by default, it is not deterministic, right? So it's actually giving us a different time every, the pro a different value every time the program runs. However, that value is the same as the program runs. So every time I restart my program, I get a different value. Um, it's also different if I, if I give it two different arrays. It is the same if I run it on the same object, all right? So here, let me, let me, let me at least show you that, all right? So let's create my array right here. I wanna convince you that, oops. Uh, See here, I want, I want to convince you that this actually works as advertised. Turn hash code. Down here, I'm going to create a new array with these values. And then let's print array.hash code. Oh, wait, sorry, hash array. All right, so I get this value. You'll see that every time I rerun the program, the value is the same. But if I run it twice on the same object, I get the same value. So if I ran this, if I started this program and I ran this a bunch of times, I'm always going to get the same result for this array. I'll tell. We'll, we can talk a little bit about why this is next time, right? But to a limited degree, the built-in Java hash code function does meet these properties that we want. Okay. So this is something that's known as a hash function. There's a whole, uh, there's all sorts of literature about hash functions and how they work, and these are sort of magic, right? They come up in cryptography, they get used a lot in the internals of various data structures, right? Uh, they're tremendously useful, right? And again, they have this property that we wanted. So essentially, a hash function is a function that maps data of arbitrary size to data of fixed size. You'll hear the result of a hash function referred to in a lot of different ways. 
Sometimes we call it a hash. Sometimes we call it a hash value or a hash code. Other times it's called a digest. Um, a lot of times I just refer to it as the hash of that object, right? Um, how many people have ever had a hash before? This is like a breakfast food. You guys have never had hash, right? Um, the, the word is not particularly poorly named, right? What a hash is, if you've ever had one for breakfast, it's a bunch of stuff all mixed up together, right? It's like it took a lot of little bits and pieces of stuff and you chopped it up and you mixed it up pretty good. Um, the reason that this has this name is that I've taken lots of little contributions from that object and mixed them all up together and I end up with this result. Delicious, right? Um, so here's a, here, th there are many, many different uh, hash functions. I will, um, you know, defer you to this particular page which describes one uh, hash function and the, the development of it. Again, I don't want to go into detail about this. Actual hash functions that get used in the wild are really nasty to read, right? They do a lot of weird things to try to combine lots of different pieces of the input together and produce a single result. Okay, so now let's talk about why these things are actually useful. What is a hash function for? Why would I want something like this, all right? Now again, at first it seems like this is just sort of this arbitrary thing that produces a scary large value. But it turns out that hash functions, again, have an incredible number of uses. A lot of the software that you guys use on a day-to-day -day basis is already using these internally to do a lot of useful things. So let me give a, you a couple of use cases, all right? So imagine that I want to do the following thing. So you, have, you want to download some piece of software, like you know, Android Studio or something like that. It's a big file that you're gonna download from, you know, the JetBrains website or whatever. Now, it does happen, not often, but from time to time, as data moves around on the internet, like a bit gets flipped somewhere. So a tiny, tiny piece of data gets corrupted. You don't get quite the exact data that you wanted. So rather than getting the IntelliJ uh, package that you're gonna, the Android Studio package that you're gonna open, that package has one tiny error in it, okay? Unfortunately, that one tiny error can basically ruin the entire piece of software. So after I download this huge file, I wanna know, did I get the right file or not? Is the contents of this file the same as what I was expecting? So before I install it, maybe this one error could produce a real bad problem when I try to install it, right? So before I install, I want to make sure that I download the file correctly. Okay, so if I have no hash function, here's what I have to do. I can essentially download the file, and again, maybe this isn't that big of a file, but imagine it's like half a terabyte or something. Download this huge file, and then what do I do? How can I make sure, how can I check to make sure I got the right file? You know, the size of the file is gonna be the same, but somewhere in there, you're worried that there's like one number that's slightly different than what, what I was supposed to get from the website. So what's one way to check? Yeah, terrible way. Well, I don't have a hash function yet. Yeah. Download it again. Yeah, that's awesome, right? So I sat there waiting for five minutes for the file to come in, and now I can sit there waiting for another five minutes, right? Not only is this slow, but the waste, this wastes a lot of resources, okay? So here's what I'm gonna do instead. This is where we'll leave off for today. I have this function. Given two files, if they're the same, it should produce the same result, and it's efficient to compute. So instead, I compute the hash of the file. That's a small value. And then I ask the server, hey, the file you sent me, do I have the right hash or not? If the hash values are the same, I install the software. If they're not, I, I re-download it. Okay, so on Monday, we'll be back here together. Uh, get working on your final project. The fair is in less than two weeks. Uh, I have a visitor here today, so my office hours today are canceled, but I will see you guys on Monday. Have a fantastic weekend.